Hello everybody, it's Mike Myers at the Thursday edition of the YouTube live stream for Ask Me Anything. The focus of this, <clears throat> Werther's Originals are delicious. Uh, the, the entire motivation for this is to give those of us who are a little bit uh, isolated because of the coronavirus an opportunity to talk about CompTIA certification. As always guys, how's my sound? I'm always worried about that these days. Uh, See, we got most of the usual suspects here, a couple of new faces, that's great. Um, anyway, uh, the, the function of this is to give those of us who are a little bit uh, uh, isolated because of the coronavirus a place to talk about certifications, in particular CompTIA certifications, IT fundamentals, A+, Net+, Security+, we can certainly go beyond that. Thank you for letting me know about the sound guys. It's an amazing uh, delay that we have, it's like a 10, 11 second delay. Uh, so, number one, the most important thing is you guys get to ask me anything you want within, uh, let's avoid religion and politics right now, but other than that, I'm wide open. Um, then, uh, also, just because you're kind enough to show up, just because you're nice enough to show up, if you look underneath here, you can see that we have a 60% discount on all of our A plus and Net plus practice bundles. So that are, those are the practice questions plus the simulations which I think anybody needs who wants to seriously consider passing the CompTIA A plus or Net plus. Uh, no, you do not have to have them, but I'm a big believer in them. I think we did a really good job with our practice questions and simulations and that uh, they will really help you pass the exam. So you get 60% off of those. All you have to use is use the code MMLive54. Uh, go to the totalsem.com website. When you buy them, use that. And on top of that 60% off of the best practice questions in the world, that's an incredible deal. Only seven thousand dollars. No, I'm kidding. Um, I honestly don't know what the price is. Uh, yeah. So anyway, uh, today I want to talk about. I was going to talk about Nmap, and we're still going to talk about Nmap today. But I don't think that's what the question really was. I think we need to talk about uh, network scanners and protocol scanners and why we actually use them. And we certainly will do Nmap today. But we're going to look at other stuff, too, that does the same job. But first, we need to understand why we're doing it. And then we're going to actually have some fun. We're going to use some protocol scanners to look around my network a little bit. The other thing is, is a lot of times, you don't need protocol scanners. It's just some basic horse sense can give you a lot of great information. So we will do Nmap today, um, but um, we're going to do more like protocol scanning and look at that from a more holistic standpoint. Uh, before that, we're going to do a little bit on uh, command line. Uh, I want to get started on command line today. Basically, I want to do more like just kind of an intro of command line today and what can be expected from different operating systems. I'm not going to go much deeper than that because we're going to then turn around and use Nmap, which is a command line tool, and I want to make sure we're, we're comfortable with that as an absolute minimum. But that's all I've got in terms of things I absolutely want to do today. Other than that, we've got oodles of time to cover any of the questions uh, you want. Mike, uh, here's TS, load him right in. Pizze is in here already, hey, Gero. Uh, TS, Mike, can you repair Win 7 with an install disk? Sure. Yes, I can. Now, the question is what kind of install disk and all that kind of thing. So it'd be Windows 7, so I'm a little rusty. We would have the pre-installation environment by then. Uh, I would either have, there would either be the ability, it's been a while since I've done 7, to have the, either I'd make an emergency repair disk it's not really called an emergency repair disk there. It's the Windows pre-environment one. And uh, yes, we'd be able to do it pretty much the same way we do with Windows 10. Kevin Lopez, what's my favorite laptop brand? Uh, probably, um, probably Dell is where I go to. Right now I'm running an MSI. Uh, this is an MSI brand laptop I'm running off of now, but it's kind of well, it's special. Also, Microsoft Surface, man. I've had this Surface for a while now, and I just love this thing. It works like a champ, and uh, it's expensive, but it, it battery lasts forever. I've been real happy with it. PowerShell versus CMD. Uh, I just go to PowerShell. In fact, we're going to do some PowerShell today. I just want to do a little bit of a light touch on it, and I'm not against the classic uh, CMD, I just don't use it anymore. PowerShell does everything I need. That's about it. 
I was installing Linux and it messed up and I get a grub rescue error. Sorry about that, man. If you're just installing Linux, I'd just go ahead and do a reinstall from there. The, the grub rescue error. I'm not, you know, actually I don't. I haven't had a lot of problems with Linux systems, to be honest with you. I certainly am familiar with Grub, and I've used that as a as for boot, but uh, I wouldn't know how to fix that, TS. Um, probably, again, you said the magic word. You said, I was installing Linux, which means you have a new install. There's nothing precious on there. Just, just start over, man. Do it again. Uh, Mike, when you remove a VM, do you remove the, car the created partition? So when I, when I uh, remove a virtual machine, what I'm going to do is I'm going to remove the file that's associated with that virtual machine, and in that is the virtual drive itself. So uh, do I remove the partition? Sure. Uh, when I make a virtual machine, I, it make, I get it, its own storage, and it's not going to be shared with anybody else. Uh, that would be the only thing. You can make a virtual machine and use other virtual machines hard drives and there you'd be careful about uh, trashing drives uh, bu -bu. Um, actually TS you could still redo the install uh, and even though it says it's dual boot with my windows on it well number one uh, probably the first thing I'd want to be doing is booting up in making sure you get copies of all your important stuff, then I'm gonna wag my finger at you. Dude, what are you doing? Using your primary like gaming machine to put a Windows Linux dual boot in? Are you crazy? Um, anyway, Axe, uh, so when you remove the VM, I there is a file that's associated with it, either VDI or VDA, VMDK, depending on what brand of uh, a virtual machine you're using and when you delete that, that deletes everything. It deletes the hard drive, it deletes the operating system, it deletes all the settings, the whole shebang. Rabin Lama, hello, hello, how's it going man? Okay, uh, so let's go ahead and get started a little bit. I thought it might be fun. What I would like to do for starters, wait, we got a couple more questions sneaking in. Ah, good, Andre. Cables are cables. They all work the same. They're twisted pairs with RJs. Yeah, you're okay. All right, so let's go ahead and uh, I want to start off by talking about command line and terminals and, and why we even do this stuff. So, but before we get into this, I have a question for you, and that is, why do we use a command line? Well, when I first started computers, that is that was the interface. I mean, just in case anybody's unsure what a command line might look like. You know what? I'm going to pull you know, one handy here. There he comes. All right. So here's just one example of a command line. And uh, when I first was starting getting computers, let's see if I can make this a little bit prettier for y'all. At least a little bit bigger, if nothing else. There we go. Being a pill, of course. There we go. So when you're looking at a command line, first of all, what you're looking at is what we call the prompt right there. So the prompt basically, and this depends on the operating system, but in general, it gives you a relative idea of where the directory structure you are. Uh, we tend to be looking, when we look, talk about a command line, we tend to be showing ourselves in a particular spot in our mass storage. In the Windows environment, we tend to call our first hard drive, or at least the first partition and with that hard drive, C is in Charlie and then we have this directory structure that goes underneath it. So we use commands like CD, which is pretty much universal for manipulating around directory structures, and then we use a command DIR that we can use to look around, and this gives us some idea of what are the contents of the mass storage of my system. So, uh, And what I'm doing now is I'm just manipulating around the directory structure just because I have Windows directory structure well organized. Now look very closely, guys. You see what I'm doing? Here, I'm going to clear this. You can see I'm actually in a folder called c colon backslash 
uh, users backslash mic backslash desktop. So what you're actually looking at right there, kids, is the contents of my actual desktop right now. So, you know, it's... So you can see, in fact, a lot of this stuff should look familiar to you guys because we've been doing a lot of this stuff for the last couple of days. There's PowerPoint presentations and things like that that we've been doing, certain programs we've already looked at. And uh, it's just uh, how the command line works. The command line was the way that we connected to our computers back in the old days. Uh, the idea of a graphical user interface really didn't manifest until, well, at least popularly, until Apple uh, came out with the first generation Macintosh in 1984. Uh, before that, all computers simply used a, a terminal to do anything you wanted. So <clears throat> if you think about what's on the mass storage of your system, you're going to have executable files that do things, and then you're going to have the data that those executable files use. So executable files were actually compiled programs that were designed ready to run in a system and you would start that particular program you could then load and, ed and edit and do whatever you want to do with your files and uh, save create new files for whatever application you were doing and uh, that's just how life was and it was good uh, to this day the command prompt rules in more serious minded computer people now granted for the user world the graphical user interface is fantastic got no problem with it at all I can do most of the things that I need to do as a maintainer of systems. I can do it faster and with better control doing it through a command line than I could, for example, doing it through a graphical user interface. Probably one of the classics is, how do you get to know what your IP address is? So, what we have are a series of commands that are built into what they call the kernel. And these uh, there's hundreds and hundreds of these. Depending on the type of command line interface you use, these can have some variants. So I'm going to type in one called ipconfig. And if you're taking A plus, Net plus, Security plus, you better know this guy. So ipconfig gives me a quick breakdown of the IP addresses that are in use by my system right now. For example, here I've got this wired internet connection, and it shows that I'm in 192.168.55.202 is my IP address, and it shows the default gateway of 192.168.55.1. I'm going to jump ahead a little bit and yell a moment about people who, I want to say this as nicely as possible. Getting into IT security can sometimes be fun because you feel like a cop and or you feel like a crook who's got, you know, the ability to do naughty things. And that's true. Uh, you do. And as you get more skills, there's no doubt that you'll begin to uh, have the ability to hack wireless networks or use social engineering to get somebody in accounting to give them your password or whatever it might be. The danger you're going to run into uh, if you're looking at IT security as a career, is that it is so tempting for you to go, oh, Mike, teach me about tool X, and then I'll be able to be a bad guy. You know, because clearly the whole secret of being a good uh, IT security person is collecting enough tools, right? Well, that's wrong, okay? There are certainly a number of tools that we use in the industry, but handing you some of these tools would be like, like giving a baby a bazooka, uh, it would frustrate you and you'd get somebody killed. So what's more important when we're talking about the tools is that you need to have an understanding of your network itself. So let's just talk about the idea that you want to hack a network, okay? Well, try hacking your own network. You ever done that? It's a lot of fun. Um, so what I need you to imagine is if you wanted to hack a network, what would be the one of the first things you could do? Well, you have to know the network. So you don't run to tools like Nmap or you know all these crazy tools. Instead, what we turn to are the basic tools, usually run from a command line like ipconfig. 
Let's take a look at ipconfig one more time. All right, so as we look at ipconfig, we've just run good old ipconfig, and we know what our IPv4 address is there, also our IPv6, but let's stick to IPv4 to make our life easy. So we know it's 192.168.55.202. But then here, look here, do you see this? It tells us what our default gateway is. Your default gateway is your upstream router. And especially in a Soho environment, what do we know about those? They probably have a web interface. And you've literally just been handed the web interface for your upstream router. Do you get the idea? Let's go take a look at this. So we saw it, and it was 192.168.55.1, correct? Hey, look at that, man. And somebody was even dumb enough to leave passwords in it. We're in the router. Woo. Crazy, scary hacker stuff, right? Do you realize what we just did there, folks? All I did is I got to a command line, and I ran ipconfig, and I got to the upstream router. Now, you might sit there and go, wow, oh, Mike, that's your router. You know. This works everywhere. Try it in a hotel. I'm serious. Get on your little wireless networks. Next time you're in a hotel, type ipconfig. You're going to see what your uh, default gateway is. Open a web browser. Just type it in. Hit enter. No, hotels are notorious for not good, having good security. So there would be one example of, you know, I'm not using any cool tools like Nmap or anything like that. I just have a basic understanding of how networking works, and I have a basic understanding of how uh, networks, uh, of, of the tool sets that I use, and I can get a lot of information. Let's take this one step further. Now, if we take a look at this, as we're looking at the basic map, you'll see that the WAN IP address for the actual router itself is 172.18.13.120. All routers also have a default gateway. All routers also have a router. The only routers that don't have routers are the tier one of the internet. So I just told you that the WAN IP address for the next router up, okay, not our localist router, but the next router up is 172.18.13, uh, and it was uh, 202 for our router. So guess what the IP address for the next upstream router is going to be? It's probably going to be dot one because that's a courtesy thing. Folks, I'm not running any fancy tools here. I'm just using logic. All of a sudden, I can figure that probably the next upstream router is going to be 172.18.13.1. Let's see if it works. Do, 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 come on. Don't worry, guys. It'll work. I tested this beforehand. There it is. So now, all of a sudden, we are in the next router upstream. Now, this is my personal router for my home office, and I'm not going to let all you dangerous people see all kinds of personal information about my system. But what I'm telling you is that without using any fancy tools, folks, all I had to do with the basic understanding of the network is be able to kind of get an idea of how the whole thing works. So we end up, and if we're good techs, we draw all this out, and we make a nice little diagram like this one here. So we've got this internal network. That's 192.168.55. I got dot one. Here's the machine I'm actually sitting on right here with a dot 202. I've actually got a Kali Linux virtual machine running on here but it's bridged, so it's going to be like dot .197. That's all those guys. And then as you go up one, there is another network, an internal network here at, at my house, 172.18.13, all right? And all I had to do was go to dot .1, and I got to that next screen. Remember that screen right there? 
And then there's another router. So this is the 802.11ax1 I plugged in uh, early this week, or was that last week? I forget. And then uh, here is the uh, my AT&T gigabit router uh, that has been here for a while. And there's some upstream addresses. And I'm going to turn that off because you guys are dangerous. All right. So. What makes people really cool is not the tools that we have. And we'll certainly cover Nmap today. It's a powerful tool and you should know about it. But don't go reaching for tools, folks. Understanding networking is far more powerful than any of these little tools. Sure, these tools do some great things. And you guys stick around with me long enough, we'll get into more cool tools and things like that. And it's always great fun. But do you get the idea of the lesson I'm trying to tell you here? I didn't need to run any crazy tools at all. I ran one tool called ipconfig from a command line and I was able to map out an entire network. Now, these other tools can be extremely handy, but do understand that know your networks. Don't go reaching for tools. You go scrambling for tools, you make me nervous. I, I want you to understand why you're gonna use a particular tool. All right. I digress when my goal was to talk about command line. We're going to come back to command line in just a minute, but let's go ahead and, and go through this a little bit. So when we're talking about a command line, we're talking about a type of interface which allows us to present commands to the CPU, to the operating system and the CPU to get work done. And traditionally we just type in words and we hit enter and things happen and then we get back to a command prompt and we type in something else. So it's not that complicated. The challenge we run into is that command lines have been around for a very, very long time. So let's go ahead and talk about, at least in the world of Windows, the type of different shells that we see out there. So here is the oldie goldie of all of them. This is the classic command shell. And uh, there's lots of built-in commands in here that we can do, whoops, do all kinds of stuff. Uh, also, like for example, if we wanted to, uh, we can go ahead and let's just wipe out the entire hard drive right now. So I'm going to type in a command called format C. And wait, now I need you to look at that very, very carefully. What does that say? Let me see if I can make that even a little bit more zoomed in for you. Access to Dine is you do not have sufficient privileges. When you come up to a computer, you log into it. Now, you might have a Windows system that's designed, or a Linux system, that's designed not to actually have you go through the process of typing in your password, but you are logging in. You cannot approach a computer, you can't boot up a computer, you can't access a computer without some form of logging in. Even if you're ex accessing a computer remotely, you're, if you're sharing a folder, you're still logging in. That, that, you can't get around that. So you have these different user accounts. Different user accounts all have the ability uh, to have, to be able to do things to resources that maybe other people can't do or to not be able to do things that other people can do. We call these generically, we call these privileges. And we saw an example of that right there with the command line where it straight up said you do not have sufficient privileges to do that scary thing. And by the way, that scary thing was format the C partition and wipe it clean, which would pretty much instantaneously end this live stream. But I understood what I could and couldn't get away with right there. And it's very important that we understand that there are certain accounts that you log in with that have great power. Uh, we tend to call these in general the super user accounts. In the Windows world, they're known as administrator accounts. And uh, in the Linux world, they're always known as SU, super user, something to that effect. These privileges are reserved for the most powerful accounts for a very good reason. Do we want just anybody walking up to this machine and formatting the C drive? Nope. So we have to go through certain processes that allow us to do things like that. In the Windows world, we actually open up a command shell, a command line 
in what's known as administrator mode. So let me show you how that works. Uh, when I, I can't even show you this right now because I, I, there's, there's no easy way for me to show this to you. Um, in the Windows world, we have the old style CMD, which I just showed you, which is being pretty quickly replaced by the far more powerful PowerShell. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna show you PowerShell real quick. And when I start a command line in the Windows world, I have the choice to start it in a normal fashion or to run as administrator. If you wanna get anything done at a command line in the Windows world, you're always gonna run as administrator. So I got PowerShell right here. Cool, all right, so this is PowerShell. Now if you look at the very top, you can see it says Administrator Windows PowerShell. Because when I started this guy up, I said run it as an administrator. Now don't let the blue screen fool you. It still has basically all the same features we saw with a regular uh, version. Whoops, <laughs> the one that, there we go. So we, we can type in, I've got this kind of zoomed in in the upper left hand corner so you can see things. So PowerShell is the default shell that we use in today's Windows environment. There are lots of shells out there, and I've just shown you two. The old school command line, the old school, the old school command shell, which was in black and white, which has been 40 years old now. There's been some upgrades, but it's still basically the same. And PowerShell, which has come along now. PowerShell's actually pretty long in the tooth as well. PowerShell's probably 20 years old but it's been improved on and improved on over and over again. Uh, the downside with the old uh, command shell is that it doesn't handle scripting very well, automated stuff. The only thing we can do with that old command shell is do something called a batch file. So PowerShell does a lot of stuff for us that goes way past that. Sure, you can still run your regular commands, but more importantly, you can run powerful shell uh, scripts that will do all kinds of amazing stuff. You get the idea? So th that's just a couple of examples. The important thing is, is that you need to be able to make sure that you are in administrator mode in Windows or in a super user mode when we're talking about Linux, okay? So let's go ahead and do this all over again, except this time what I wanna do is do it in Linux and we're gonna look at the most famous of all, the Bash shell. So what I'm running right here is a version of Linux called Kali Linux. Uh, Kali is a very, very powerful uh, distribution that a lot of people who are into IT security like to use. And if you've been gonna be taking Security Plus, you'll definitely be seeing more and more of this. Now, if you take a look at this closely, you're gonna see some difference compared to the other uh, command lines that we saw in Windows. In the Linux world, this type of command line is known as a shell, and this one's known as a bash, B-A-S-H shell, which is a very, very popular one. It's not the only one, but it's probably one of the more popular ones. In the Linux world, a lot of the commands to do basic stuff like, well, for example, CD. Uh, CD still works, but it has a couple of extra functions that make it act a little bit, I can barely see this. I'm trying to do this from memory, guys. The, uh, you guys can see it up close, but I can't. Oh, I think it worked. All right. Uh, so certain commands like the CD, they, they still work, but work a little bit differently. Other commands like DIR, which is really a Windows command, they work here, but here in the Linux world, they prefer the command LS. The DIR and the LS commands simply show you what is in the current folder or directory that you're in at that moment. Uh, today, in the Windows and in the Mac environment, we call them folders, but back in the old days, they were called directories. CD, change directory, that's all that stands for. So uh, that's just one little kind of cool tool that we can do with this. So as we take a look at uh, this tool, we can uh, take a look at contents, we can run programs, and probably one of the most fun programs everybody wants to run these days is called Nmap. Try that again. So 
So what we're getting here is uh, some errors, basically, because Nmap doesn't just run by itself. So before we run Nmap, which is probably one of the more common command line utilities you're going to use in a Linux environment, let's talk about <coughs> network discovery and why we use Nmap. Nmap, and there's a lot of other tools that do this, and you're going to see them right now. Nmap has two big jobs. Job number one, look on this network, primarily in single broadcast domains, and tell me who else is here. Are there other computers on this network? That's the first thing it needs to do. The second thing it needs to do is it goes, okay, I have found this one device. Maybe it finds a camera, okay? What ports is this camera listening on so that I might be able to check their security? Get the idea? The number one thing that you want to do when you're going into a new network is you want to know what other computers are on this network and what are they listening on? Those two questions are the most important questions that penetration testers and people like that want to look for. They're looking for places to attack you, and this is the first thing they look for. So the only difference between penetration testing and vulnerability testing is that one person is on one side and one person's on the other. We do the same tools and everything. So Nmap is a analyzer that's designed to look out on networks and find stuff and see what they're listening to. So the problem with Nmap is that Nmap, well, first of all, Nmap works great. It's been around for a long time. Uh, okay, other thing issue, not quite the second one, is that Nmap ran for years with a graphical user interface that you could run from like an Ubuntu desktop called uh, Zenmap, and it's been deprecated. And it, I ran uh, Kali, and it didn't come with Zenmap, so no problem. We were talking about command line. What a great reason for us to play with the command line a little bit and uh, actually get some work done. So uh, we are going to have to look at Nmap from a pure command line interface, which can be a little bit hard to read, but hopefully I've got this in such a situation that you guys can uh, see it just fine. I had a typo, Scott. I don't make typos. Is there a typo in my diagram? I don't see it. Oh well. All right, so anyway, let's go ahead and uh, head on over into Kali, and let's take a look at some of the stuff we have here. Now, first of all, uh, what I want to do is, Nmap is a very powerful tool, but sometimes it can be slow. So I've pre-made a couple of Nmap runs uh, just so that you guys can see some examples. So what I've done here is, let me get this neat corner, so I want you guys to be able to see this really clearly. Do you see this command right here? So what we're doing here is we have started up Nmap, and because Nmap most of the time wants to run with uh, elevated privileges, we use the term sudo. So we type in sudo, and that means anything we run after that will be as a super user. This is very different than Windows. In Windows, you just open up a terminal, you open up a shell, you open a command line, we, we can interchange those terms all we want. You open that up as an administrator. Get the idea? Then you can run anything you want. It's not that way in Linux. It's not that way under, in, in a bash shell. What you do is you just fire up a terminal, and then if you're doing stuff that's scary, you type in the sudo command, get the idea? Sudo followed by whatever scary command you want to do, then it's going to prompt for a password, and if you got the username and password right, you got the privileges. Okay, so what I've done here is I type sudo, and I've run the command nmap, minus f as in frank, and then a particular range that I want to look at. So, nmap minus F with a capital F and then the network ID. The whole secret to running nmap is you type in sudo if you need to, which is most of the time, then you type in nmap, and then you type in these switches. Here on this example I just showed you was a minus capital F. Minus capital F means two things. It means, look, go ahead and try to find all the computers you can on this 
network ID, but only look for the 100 most common port numbers that people are listening on. Because if you run Nmap full blow and you're like, check every port, it's gonna check 65,536 ports on every single system, yipe. So it's, if you're doing a class C, which means WAC 24, which means you're gonna have 254 hosts times 65,536, that means it could be running for days before it gets you answers. So what we've done here is we've done it in a very simple mode and we're just saying run it uh, and just check, just check for the first, it's gonna check for port 80, port 443, port 137, 139, you know, the common ones, okay? All right, so let's go back and take a look at this now. So when this guy ran, he only found two computers on this network. He found 172.18.13.1, oh wait, there's more than that. There's got, oh yeah, what am I saying? Never mind. He finds a bunch of computers on this network. So here's the dot one, which is gonna be the router, and it's open on port 80 and port 443. Well, that makes sense. I mean, we, we saw that it had a web interface for us to be able to make changes, so yeah, it better be open on port 80 and port 443. Now, if I was a bad guy, here's where I would start looking for exploits. Maybe I could get in and uh, you know, now all I need is the username and password, and I am in the router. Once I'm in the router, I can do anything I want. Uh, people using default usernames and passwords, stuff like that. So that's where Nmap helps us. It's finding all the different hosts that are in that network and what ports are open. Then with that knowledge, we use, turn to other tools to be able to do more scary stuff. Let's keep looking at Nmap because it found a lot in here. So here's somebody's iPhone that's running. Now you notice here when the state says open, right here open, that means it is open. When it sees the word filtered, that means that there's probably a firewall, that it sees there's a, a open port there, but it's behind a firewall. Here's something called EERO, and it's open on port 53. It's my wireless mesh network, EERO, which is a popular brand name of wireless mesh networks. And like most networks, uh, WAPs, they're gonna go ahead and propagate DNS information. Let's keep going. So I've got some Amazon device. I think that that is an Amazon Fire Stick. Here's a 52, eight, I don't even know what that is. Is there any clue? Nope, I don't have anything obvious in here. This happens all the time though. What do we got here? Mike's works, this is a stand, here, here we can see, look at this. Open port 135, open port 139, open port 445, do you see all those? Just by using Nmap, and I see that these open ports, 135, 139, well 137, 138, 139, 445, this is how Windows shares folders and files. If I saw a computer out there and I saw those open ports, I know I got a Windows system, or at the very least, a Samba system. Do you see how just knowing our port numbers can really allow us to go in and look at stuff and, and be able to figure it out? But wait, there's more. So I got a Roku on here, they're boring. I have no idea what that is but I can see that it's probably running, uh, it's probably a Windows type system. And uh, there's actually one I'm particularly looking for I want you guys to see. There's my Galaxy Fold. Here, this one's kind of interesting. This one right here, that's my garage door opener. And I've got an open HTTPS port, open HTTP port. I'm gonna have to check that out. But here's the one I was looking for right here. See this and this one right here? Those are cameras, folks. I know they're cameras because I set them up. And in particular, I see that they have the uh, RTSP protocol open on port four, uh, 554. Better be open on the other one too. 
and the other one here has an open port 80. It's actually pretty simple. What's happening here is that all the cameras are slaved into one primary camera, and that camera I can actually open up on port 80 and look at the contents. Don't bother trying to get into it though, because just because you can get into it on port 80, it needs a very special driver, and uh, yeah, so it's a little bit trickier than that. But it is pretty cool though. The bottom line is, <coughs> is that Nmap, using this one default uh, version, allowed us to go in and scan for the other devices on the network and tell us what ports are open and available. Those are the two things that we need done more than anything else. What separates Nmap from a lot of other tools is that you can program it to be much more aggressive, you can program it to be much more subtle, it can handle scripts, it can do all kinds of stuff. Um, and uh, people in the Linux world absolutely love it. What I want you to know though is that it's not the only choice out there. There are wonderful protocol testers that you can find on all kinds of things. So let me show you an oldie goldie that I love. So this is somebody called Angry IP Scanner. And what I'm gonna do is, why is it typing, oh I know why it is. Angry IP Scanner, I'm gonna tell it, I want it to scan the network I'm in. <coughs> do a class C, watch this, boink. So I'm going to I want it to scan 192.168.55.1 to 192.168.55.255, you can just let that start. Now it's going to take a minute to run, but while it's running we can see a couple things that are kind of interesting. First of all, it found dot .1 because it starts at the beginning. And there's not a lot of other stuff on here, so it's going to find a lot of dead things, which is okay. In fact, it's got a lot more searching to do. Here we go. So we found a couple more systems on here, and to be honest with you, I think that's about it. There's only those three systems. There's the router itself, my Kali box, and then this, this uh, MSI laptop, okay? So anyway, let's go back and take a look at that one more time. All right, so what we're gonna do here is we can take a look and this guy tells us what it sees, but it doesn't tell us what ports are open. So to do that, you usually have to, I'm right clicking here, and I'm gonna say open computer in a web browser, let's see if that even works. And by golly, it did. So basically all it did is it took this and, and threw it right in there. Here, let me show you a little more, more carefully. It saw this host name out there, and all it did is went into a, open a browser up and type that in for me automatically right there. Angry IP Scanner is completely free. It's graphical. Uh, there's even a better version that I don't like as much because it requires Java. Not that it, there's not there anything wrong with it, I just don't like it. But you notice what it's done is it allowed me to do a quick and dirty and fairly quickly and graphically show me all the known hosts on that particular network. Kind of the same thing Nmap did. But Nmap took it another step further, remember? So not only did Nmap uh, find all the hosts, it told me what ports are open. So we can do that. So what I want to do is show you another tool called Ad Advanced IP Scanner. So Advanced IP Scanner is a pretty cool tool. Now what we're going to do here is I could search the same network we just searched, but that's boring. I'm going to search the ne next network upstream because that will be less boring. I'm going to go ahead and fire that up. Now, this thing's not instantaneous, but it will start to find stuff that's out there. So I'm going to give this just a minute and let it do some searching. Oh, it's found quite a few things. Well, it should find quite a few things. I've got a garage door opener on this network. I've got cameras on this network. I've got uh, mesh router devices on this network. I got home theater systems and Roku boxes and all kinds of stuff. So yeah, we should be seeing quite a few things on this network. And uh, let's go back. It looks like he's still searching, but I think he's found some stuff for us. Now what this tool does that's a little bit different than what we saw before is that 
we don't just right click, we'll see this little thing here. And that will give us clues as to what is open. So on this particular one, on my workstation, which is my upstairs work computer, uh, port 80 is open. So we can actually test that. So that's going to be 172, 18, 13, 113. Do you see where I got that right there, folks? 172, 18, 13, 113. So I'm going to open up a browser. I'm going to type in 172.18.13.113. Hit enter. Ta da! All right. So I've got a copy of IIS, Internet Information Services, running on that particular machine. Uh, it's, it's in the wild, it's unprotected. I was probably just playing with web servers on that machine. All right, heading back to the here, let's see, did you find anything else that's interesting? All right, here's this thing called MyQ, which I happen to know is my garage door opener. And it's got an HTTP connection. And here's the, one of my cameras, this one probably finds the HTTP connection there too. Yep, no big surprise. So that's what Nmap's all about. And now you see there's two other tools that I used in a Windows environment called Angry IP Scanner and Advanced IP Scanner that kind of do the same thing. But I, you might notice there's one big difference. Do you notice the graphical tools weren't nearly as good on the uh, ports that Nmap was? Nmap's famous for being able to query ports. Nmap can pretend to do different things. It can give itself a fake IP address. It can send malformed packets. It can do all kinds of stuff because when you start sniffing around on a network, you're going to be setting off intrusion detection and intrusion prevention systems. And that's where tools like Nmap are vastly superior to these cute little Windows-based tools like Angry IP Scanner because it can be a lot more subtle. It can be trickier. It can hit more slowly. It can only ask for port 80s and stuff like that. So, but that's really all Nmap does. So one more time for the test, why do we use Nmap? To find hosts on a broadcast domain, and number two, to find what open ports there are so that we might be able to close up vulnerabilities. That's it. That's all we do for Nmap. Nmap is a great tool, but that's all it does. And that's a really, really important job. I have not looked for questions in ages. I'm going to look, and you guys are going to swamp me here, no doubt. How did it get to be 247 so fast? Duh. Oh, God, you guys, that's all I need is a bunch of uh, nerds in here. Okay. Yeah, everybody ping my gateway. Thanks. Let me get, where are we? Okay, here we go. Architectural controls. I noticed, though, the video series use a lot of third-party tools. How do you evaluate tools when they come from third parties? I use them constantly is the answer. Architectural controls, I-H-O-A. I use them constantly. Most of these are super famous tools also. I mean, it's not like I invented these or, you know, they come out of some scary corner. These are well-known tools. So they have lots of great reputation out there. Allison, as, yes, I sent you, uh, Allison, I saw your email and I'm, I'm prepared to respond. I'm preparing to respond. Yes, there's lots of fun things to play with. I was hoping people were taking notes, Brendan S. Uh, Michael Walver, yes, you could also use Traceroute to find upstream routers. You absolutely can. Tolowit, you're evil. Scott Jernigan's evil. PowerShell debuted in 2006, so it's only 14 years old. Yes, born again shell. Linux is case sensitive, it sure is. Yeah, I'm looking at some of these things you guys are asking about from 10 or 15 minutes ago, so I'm trying to remember. <clears throat> Brendan S, is Kali Linux better than Ubuntu for Nmap use? No, it's the exact same tool on either machine. I like Kali because Nmap's pre-installed and ready to go. That's the only thing. You could easily install it into Ubuntu as well. 
There's Scott Jernigan answering all those questions. Uh, you can run Nmap in Windows. I just don't like doing it. I just, I never got into the habit of using Nmap. Uh, Nmap for years used a SIGWIN environment, which just bothered me. So I, I, I don't do it. This is Network Plus or Security Plus theme, both. Very much, Jao Sosa, you will, both of them. Uh, do I have a burn in on my screen? I didn't see it. Mm -mm -mm -mm. Jao left already, we were having just, we're just starting to have fun with him. Uh, uh, TS fixed your, my MBR, I'll have to hear about that. Andre de Goyer, Class D special IP address. Are they used for video conference? Or is it just one address talking and showing you? Oh, wait a minute. Class D special, God, I don't even remember all the Class Ds anymore. I'll look it up real quick. Class D, I P A D D R E S S. Class full. Class D, uh, the old multicast. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so those are all going to be two, two, fours. Okay, I'm ready to answer your question now, brother. Are they used for video conferencing? They have been used for video conferencing. Or is it just for one address talking show and the others just listening? Neither one. I mean, the idea is that you would create temporarily on, let's just say your machine right here was the machine that wanted to pick up a, a video. Uh, you would take on, as well as anybody else who wanted to watch that video, would take on a special 224 address. So there, you, you would have your regular IP address, but then you'd also have this 224 address and that's how multicasting finds you, is that lots of people have the same address in an IPv4 environment. And uh, it's not done a ton, but uh, it was definitely done. So, are they used for video conference? Yes. Or is it just, no, it's used for video conference, so I'm not sure what the or is. I have a CentOS VM, would Nmap work in the command line? Absolutely would, Kevin. Thanks for going over this Nmap stuff, Mike. Yeah, I mean, the problem is, is people are like, Show me how to use Nmap to hack. I'm like, come on, man. I mean, you don't even know how the tool works. You're a baby with a bazooka. You know, it's like, somebody's like, here is a Phillips screwdriver. Show me how to defuse the bomb. It's like, come on, man. Understand how bombs work and all that, and then I'll hand you a screwdriver. Uh, Nmap is wonderfully powerful. Like, for example, one of the things you should look into on Nmap on your own, you're never going to be tested on this on a CompTIA exam, but you should look at all the different types of scanning that it does. Some scans are more aggressive, but they find more. Some scans are less aggressive. Uh, so there's a lot of things you can do in there to control what Nmap looks for, and what you're going to do, it varies on every single situation. You know, what, what intrusion detection is catching you every time? You know, so stuff like that. Uh, nobody bothers memorizing the 500 different switches that come with Nmap. It's crazy. Um, but to be able to, number one, understand that you can adjust how Nmap scans, and then number two, once it finds a host, you can adjust how it scans the ports. So there's a whole bunch of dash S options and a whole bunch of dash, dash P options. My job is to make sure that you know that Nmap exists, why we use it, and in terms of the granularity and stuff like that, that's up to you. It's not gonna be on the test. It's not even gonna work. I have a friend of mine who's a professional chef, graduated from the Culinary Institute of America, and uh, very successful. And I was always like so amazed. It's like, wow, the CIA, man, he uh, must have learned all these thousands of amazing recipes and stuff like that, and how to cook all these different menus, and, and I asked him, how do, you, how do you memorize all this? He goes, Mike, all I did was learn how to chop. I always thought that was profound and had some great tie-ins on stuff like this. It's very dangerous when I start handing you guys toys, 
Make sure you understand why you're dealing with the toys. Make sure you understand a lot of times that the information that you need to obtain doesn't require any of these toys anyway. Remember how I did with IP config? Uh, so there, there's lots of, of, of powerful ways to deal with this stuff. Take advantage of these tools. You will never find anybody who will teach you all the different ways to use Nmap because there's like infinite number of them. Get the idea? Figure it out, folks. I'm only here to teach you how to chop. Leo Nosick, that's a new name. Welcome aboard. Uh, install Kali on Hyper-V? Sure, why not, Diego, go for it. I use boot repair in Linux Mint Live Disk and repair, it wasn't, I, yeah, TS, I'm kind of clueless in that particular world. In a real world, how and when would you use a task scheduler? Well, if you're running Windows 10, you use it every day. Uh, I'm not, task scheduler is always there to, uh, Windows for def by default has a, a defragmenter in there already. Ah, oh, gosh, I forget what's in there. I can look it up real quick, can't I? Mm -hmm. So what's all in here by default? Uh, okay, so I'm just looking at task scheduler on my system right here, and I didn't put any of this in, okay? So, uh, Allison, this is just what comes by default. There are certain daytime triggers that check for this monitors the state of your whatever, of Office 2 Microsoft. Uh, this task, and I'm just reading here in Task Scheduler. This task ensures that Microsoft Office installation can check for feature updates. Uh, what's one core? And all I did, I've just opened up Task Scheduler on this one Windows system. That's boring. Under Windows, there's a ton of tasks that go on. Uh, so really, you're not necessarily using Task Scheduler directly, Allison. What's happening is you've installed an enterprise backup system, and it needs to put something where the backup runs individually on each system at 4 o'clock in the morning. or um, you know, there, There's stuff like that. that. That would just get you started. Fire up test. Uh, Fire up task schedule, you're gonna see there's a bunch of tasks in there already. Kevin Lopez, have you done ethical hacking in your career? I don't know. Yes? I'm not sure, I'm not sure how much I wanna develop that. Okay. AJ Adams, welcome aboard. What's the main difference between the CompTIA CYSA exam code CS001 and 002. Uh, AJ, well, it's been a major update is all we know for sure. Um, is Scott Jernigan, is that one out already? Let's see if he's already, Scott's notorious for typing stuff in over here. Uh, da, 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 da. I don't have the quick answer on that. I am so embarrassed. Scott, what, what is the... I, I'm, I'm checking right now. I took CYSA and it, it was just one exam. It is still just one exam. The CYSA Plus is coming out April 21st. We don't have, I personally don't have good information on it. I know we had another person coming in to shoot videos and the coronavirus messed everything up. I'll tell you what, the first thing we're gonna talk about tomorrow is we will talk about CYSA Plus and the different versionings. AJ Adams, I'm gonna do that just for you, brother. And we will get that 
squared away and get you the answer you need. Other than that, tomorrow is going to be Friday. Friday is always our big giveaway day. We'll be giving away books. We'll be giving away gift certificates. It's crazy out there. Anyway, uh, so that ought to cover it for today. I know that I really just barely touched terminals and uh, I intentionally didn't go any further into Nmap because you need to play with it and work out the details you need. Uh, I just introduced you to the concept of a Phillips screwdriver. You get to have the fun from there. Um, tomorrow, the only thing I have in uh, for sure to do is we're going to answer AJ Adams' question about CYSA. Uh, I may do an, I may get us started on 802.11. I know a lot of people had asked about 802.11 AX, but what really surprised me, I had a lot of people send me emails going, Mike, I need to know about 802.11. So we might do just a, a more of a basic thing like that. Also keep in mind, folks, feel free to contact me anytime. This is my email address. Uh, my, that's my office and then my home address. It's my Steam address for if you're a gamer. I'm not using the phone number right now because of the virus. You could get a hold of me if you wanted to through that number, but I'd rather you just send me an email and I'll give you my cell phone. And when in doubt, call on Desweds. Also keep in mind that just because you guys were here today, you get 60% discount on the combined A plus and Network Plus test bundles. So that's 60% off, it's an amazing, amazing deal. You should all be taking incredible advantage of that. But until then, that's about all I got. So for tomorrow, be ready for lots of giveaways, okay guys? And keep in mind that we're going to be having a ton of fun. And until then, this is your Uncle Mike saying, good night. Good night.